Hi, I'm Jessica Pinto, co-founder of La Piazza Academy. Hola, soy Jessica Pinto, eh, fundadora de La Piazza Academy en Miami, Florida. Si quieres tener un poco más de información en español sobre nuestra filosofía de educación, me puedes contactar, puedes buscar en nuestro colegio o en las redes sociales o simplemente ve a Google y busca por La Piazza Academy. Estaré feliz de contestar tus preguntas y de que conozcas un poco más de nuestro sistema educativo. Brave Talks is powered by Zencaster. Welcome to Brave Talks. It's so nice to have you on the show. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. So nice to be here too. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and and I'm grateful for being here with you today. Me too. I'm grateful you're here, especially because. I am so moved and inspired by your education, um, your philosophy at La Piazza Academy in Miami, and and you know greater than that, your your perspective on the world and our interconnectedness as human beings. The first time I went to La Piazza, I was being toured around the school, and one of the educators, we were in a classroom. And one of the educators got on her knees and spoke to a child. And I, I think that the girl was wearing a tutu ballerina dress up costume. And the educator said, how does it make you feel? And instead of saying, you look so pretty, you're so beautiful. Instead, it was focused on the experience of what the feeling was. And I was so blown away by that one experience. It completely changed my parenting style. It changed my experience of how I speak with children and to people in general, and to make the process of things, not about this surface level end result, but about the process, the journey, the feeling, the experience. And I'm just so incredibly grateful that you created a home for for little little adults little individuals to feel respected and honored and seen and heard and not some nuisance that needs to be ushered through an education just to get to the next step yeah totally and that's one of the main Things that uh, when I opened the school is like, what would be the school that I would have liked to go when I was a child? That was the first thought. And obviously, as a child and as an adult, you want to be seen, right? You want to be uh, taken into consideration that what you say and what you feel, it's heard. And that's the first thing. Uh, why to really have a vision of children as non-competent human beings where they're so competent and they're so smart and capable of doing amazing things and saying amazing things. At the end of the day, if you think about it, they end up being our, our teachers in life because throughout our own children is where we learn a lot of, a lot of inter, like a lot of things and And that's one of the first messages I give to every educator that comes that, go, that goes to our school. It's what is the image of the child that you have? And we work in that part a lot. The image of the child that we should have is an image of a competent, of a smart, of a kind, a, of a child with many, many uh, possibilities of doing different things. And based on that, we work with the child. It's not, it's not seeing the child as an empty canvas. It's seeing it as a, as a whole, like as an art piece, you know, full of possibilities and things to do with the child. So for us, it, it's the respect that you feel in La Piazza. And, and again, the image that we have of children is, is really big. And we respect them as much as we respect ourselves among our educators, as well as, as much as we respect parents too. And they feel it. I think they feel it and they, they know their scene and they know their voice is so powerful in our school. It is. I and On part of the tour, we actually went into an older classroom as well. And each child was encouraged to get on stage and 
give some type of performance or experience or dance or song or speech. And the entire classroom sat around the stage. And I was explaining to my husband yesterday, I said, it wasn't practice in your traditional sense of public speaking, but it was practice on both ends as the performer and the the one being seen. And then as the audience, they were space holders. They weren't just twiddling their thumbs and just making fun of the person on stage or laughing or whatever. They were learning how to hold space in community. And what a deep lesson to learn in your formative years growing up, holding space for all types of diversities, all types of language abilities, multicultural, multidimensional, amazing cosmic human beings. This is when we have to do it, you know, not waiting until they are in middle school or high school. Why not to do it now? Why not why not to really have a good foundation for our children? And why not to as a school open the space, open the time, you know, to do it. We are so, I think the education system is so concentrated into uh, giving and providing information to children that we forget about having the space to, to really share and learn as a community. We have our community days at our school and we talk about really important and deep subjects, you know, like from where they are little, you know, what is equality? how we respect each other in our differences and how do I love myself? Because before one of the things that we worked this year, it's more about let's accept who we are and let's love ourselves because we are unique and different. And that's what makes us uh, beautiful. And once we accept who we are, we really start kind of also loving and accepting others. And we, you know, we, we have an art teacher and we have, you know, everybody like is like on board on that. You know, we reflect before giving this to, to our children of how we're going to expose this concept to our community, you know, to our children. And what are the experiences that we're going to create so they really understand the concept of, let's say, diversity, equality, or loving ourselves. And it's amazing how children, you know, start working in their experiences because, you know, we don't call activities. We call everything that we do is an experience. You know, it's something that is going to stay with us. Activities, usually we do an activity and it's done, you know, next. And experiencing something that we really live it, feel it, and it stays with us. So we said, okay, what experience do we create for children that they really get? this concept that we want to teach. In this case, it was self-love. Again, I mean, if you see our social media and, you know, as a mom, you receive, you know, your newsletters, uh, you see all the concepts that we covered throughout the year. And this was a very special year. You know, we we went, we didn't, as a school, put too much attention of into the problem, into the problems that are happening out there. This has been a very challenging year and said, what are the opportunities that we have here to discuss with our children? So it's been an amazing year because, you know, with all the things happening out there, we saw them as, okay, there's a lot to do. Let's start working with our children in talking about social justice, you know? What is social justice, you know? What are the uh, experiences that we can create in a classroom to really absorb that term and see how they see themselves working for the community now and we did things that we work for the community with the kids and all the discussions are back and forth with with the educator i think it's amazing when you partner with your children with your learners this is not about me being in a in a in a higher level as an educator this is about partner about a partnership and not only with your children you know we involve the families too they've been involved in this process there's a uh, saying, well, it was written in um in the book Recapture the Rapture by Jamie Wheel. But he said, you know, over the next, well, Stephen Hawking said over the next hundred years, you know, if we don't make drastic, radical changes to the way that we treat the environment, and I will add to our interconnected 
global citizenry, right? If we don't make these drastic changes and start realizing that we're all interconnected, all of us, no matter what side of the political aisle you sit on, no matter how much money you make, no matter what color your skin is or what country you live in, we are all a part of this tapestry of the world. And so what Jamie was saying in his book was that, you know, there are doomsday people that say, oh, this is it. Go to Mars and peace out and not save this planet because it's doomed. Or you can be the hopeful person that stands strong and still and doesn't try to run from the problem, but faces it and says, I have hope. And this is my action and this is my responsibility as a global citizen, as an individual in this tapestry and to be hopeful. You know, we need that radical hope and that um, responsibility to to ha- to see the silver linings, to have the hope. And it's it's a contagious thing, right? Like compassion and hope, these are these are experiences and feelings that have three degrees of separation, you know, like three people away from you will experience the hope that you're sharing now on Brave Talks or sharing at school. It's contagious. It's contagious. And consensually, you know, um, as I mentioned to you, I mean, and right now I'm visiting my grandma in my home country, Colombia. And I was talking to one of my cousins and she is very into sustainability, taking care of our land She's a, she's probably 22 and uh, she wants to do so many things, but I noticed she didn't have so much hope. She said, but you know what? I feel like, I don't feel that people want to make that change. And I feel that there's so many things to do, but I continuously see people damaging our world. And, you know, I kind of felt the sadness. And I said, no, I mean, you are the hope, you know, you are, we are, I'm believing in you. And there's a lot of people that I believe in, in people that wanted to well for our planet, for for our communities, and they cannot lose the hope. I think children and young people, it's something that even though we see an exterior world that is probably showing us a different picture, you know, that yes, we're using plastic and and we're doing things that we shouldn't. I think there is a big group that really wants to make a change. And we have to go with that group. We have to be part of that group. And I think that group is going to get bigger and bigger and, and be optimistic that things can happen. Because we can have good intentions, but probably we can get um, a lot of disappointments on the way too. But we have to move forward and continue doing the best that we can for for again, for, for our planet, for our world, for, for people that are next to you know to us that live in our communities and not to lose the hope. Uh, because intentions need, you know, and skills need something that is called hope and and I think uh, you know I'm I'm an optimistic. I'm an optimistic um, and it's just that, you know, that I said, you know what, young people need to need to know that there's a big group of also of adults of, you know, different generations are supporting their dreams and, and their intentions as well. We borrow the world from our children. The hope is really reliant on, you know, one of the essential life skills that we need for children is like this self-regulation. But in order to have this self-regulation is the ability to trust. And for me, that becomes spiritual. You know, can we trust whether you believe in God or not, you know, like, can we trust whatever it is that we'll go as the river and that the path is already set? As long as we do our best, whatever that is, we can surrender to the fear mindset of, or I have hope and I feel fear or anger that there are other people destroying this collective universe that we share, but instead to say, I'm doing my best and I have hope and to stay optimistic because trust is a, is an interesting experience and 
it takes trust to trust, right? Like totally. I mean, this is not about. I think it's it goes beyond religion. It goes beyond of you know what or who do we believe in. It's more about. I think, just being present and doing the best that we can, and just trusting, as you're saying, the moment. You know, thinking that whatever is going to happen. It's because it's meant to be. You know, there are things that we want to force so bad and that we want to change and that we want to. But I think, I don't know, I think at the end, things work out when you, um, in a way that probably at the moment we say this is not the best outcome or, but at the end, something is stitching us, you know, that this is the way that it was meant to be. And we're learning from that. Even though if it was not the outcome that we wanted, there's something to learn. And that is something good. I, I, I think it's, it's very important what you mentioned, it, you know, just waking up and, and having that moment with yourself, you know, meditating or praying or just a kind of reflecting on the uh, present things that you have and being grateful it's a good way to start and understand why things happen. And does La Piazza still have everyone meditate when they come into the building? I think it's a, it's a way of being for us. You know, we have a, our morning meeting in every classroom. And every time that we have our morning meeting, there is a space for, for reflecting, for breathing. You know, we, we try to breathe with our kids. And into the breathing is when... You know, meditating probably it's a big term for our children. We use it when we start to, you know, when they start understanding what it is. But from little on, we work in a lot of breathing. Just feel your breath, you know. And when a child has a, a tantrum or has, a, you know, a challenge, it's like, let's breathe. And it's, it's obviously, it's, it's part of our culture as a school. Even our in our staff meetings, you know, we... I love to bring always, um, you know, our mindful moments with our therapist. And the first thing that we do as, as educators, uh, the way that we open our, our professional development days is with our moment to, to meditate and, and to reflect. And I think that's very important, you know, as, as an educator, especially. You know, because you have to deal not only with children, but you have to deal with with families, with other, you know, educators as well. And I I think it, it's very needed. And, and we need to really kind of teach that to our children too. How to take that moment for, for ourselves, to connect with ourselves. For me, that moment is about connecting with myself and also about creating space between reaction and response. You know, what that three second window looks like. Could that actually prevent bullying? Could it widen your lens of perspective and help understand what someone else is experiencing so that you can have empathy or compassion for what they're going through or see that it's not about me you know, what they said has nothing to do with me. Maybe it's because they're afraid or they're scared or something's going on outside of, you know, this situation. And it's just, I was the one that was in front of them. And so that is like, for me, I was bullied when I was younger in elementary school. I think a lot of us were just because, you know, you throw a bunch of kids into a classroom and you don't have conscious leadership. You just have educational leadership and, you know, you forget that really important piece for, for children to have mindful, you know, not to sound like buzzwordy, but like this, you know, mindful leadership where it is imperative to teach children to slow down, take a deep breath, reflect, have gratitude for all that we have, um, have compassion, to be generous, to widen our our perspective and see other people's experiences. And so, you know, it just is so exciting for me to see how you've taken, you know, that 
and actually applied it into school instead of just using it as a marketing tool, which I've seen in other schools, like we do yoga. And I'm like, well, that's great. Like, when do you do yoga? And they're like, every Friday, it's 30 minutes. And I'm like, it ends at that. Like you were saying, you're, it's not an activity, it's an experience. To integrate every experience throughout the entire school day, but also their lives at home. You know, it doesn't just stop when when school runs out. This is something that like bleeds into their lives and their homes and their families. Yeah, it, it's. I think uh, it's more about uh, having this as a practice, something that it's as you're saying, something that is not going to be only for a moment, but it's something that they're going to use for their for their own life, for, I mean, for a lifetime. It's, it's a practice that we want to start from early on. And Emily, if you think there's always going to be people that are going to hurt us and they're going to um, make us feel bad, but I think the power is more in how we react to those situations and how children can react, you know, when they feel that, uh, that somebody kind of crossed that line and it's just taking that moment to think, okay, what is, how do I describe this feeling, right? How, why am I feeling this way? And is this true about what that person say about me? Or, you know, like, yes, my, my feelings were hurt, but, but I can't overcome this doing this or, or, or just thinking in a different way, or where is this person coming from? Why this person acted with me in that way? And understanding that situation, coming to not from a judgment place, but more from an understanding, uh, you know, the other person or the action that her is coming from. And I think children, instead of being kind of um, afraid of being bullied, I think we have to give them the power to know how to react to these situations, because this is something that we're going to face all our lives, not necessarily with the term bully, but with the term of people telling us things that we don't like and that we feel that are offensive and that probably that person is not doing it with an intention, but it's just because they that's their personality. So how do we create in ourselves that power of seeing where is that person coming from and not letting that affect in who we really are. It is so inflammatory to respond outside of school as a parent to respond with a knee jerk reaction, you know, Oh, that kid, like just pushed my kid on the playground. Oh, you should like reprimand your child and, you know, apologize. And this like very aggressive infl inflammatory response when if we widen our lens of perspective, got on our knees spoke with the children, mediated on their level, tried to understand where they were coming from. Sure, like one of the child, the children got hurt and it was unfair and unjust, but maybe that was a learning lesson of justice. Even as the, the hurt individual, understanding that maybe the other kid just wanted his Frisbee back. And it's so challenging when you have your most precious gem in front of you that gets hurt, right? And you just want to save them from all these punctures that life like pokes us with yes and, and that's one of the first things that we want to do as a parent you know it's to protect them you know it's just like just put them into this crystal ball it's, we don't want anything to happen to them but i think what we need to do is the opposite i think we just need to expose them into the real world because in that way they're going to get the real skills that they're going to need to to face the challenges to face you know other people that are like challenging you know and those are the really that's the gift that that's the gift the real gift that we need to give to our children a message from our partner do you ever think about starting a podcast i recommend using zencaster as your recording platform when you sign up for zencaster use the code emily nolan one word with a capital E and a capital N to get 14 days free and 40% off three months of Zencaster Pro. That works out to $12 a month for unlimited audio and video recording. I look forward to hearing what you have to share with the world and I'm rooting for you. Let's get back to the show. I wanna talk about the arts and creativity. 
when I walked around your school, you have an atelier and it is this stunning art studio. And I think all of it is like recycled materials and you do such a beautiful job um, creating a low waste environment, which is so incredible. It's yet another lesson that children learn from and you utilize those art experiences, um, not just in the atelier, but also you you're doing projects or working on experiences that, you know, are also part of the morning meeting and part of the hypothesis that the the classroom has made and is trying to discover, like, how did dinosaurs g- become extinct? And then they're doing dinosaurs in the atelier and they're trying to figure it out through modeling and, and all this stuff. So that is fantastic. And another thing that really impressed me was the music experiences that you offer. I've toured many schools that have offered musical experiences through what seemed like loving expression. Uh, But it also seems like, you know, as parents, we want our children to learn piano. We want our children to play violin. And the key word there is we want them to do that. And what I see in La Piazza and in your educational philosophy, which is rooted in uh, Waldorf, or no, sorry, is it Waldorf or Reggio Emilio? It's, it's a progressive. I mean, we take the best approach from, from every, uh, let's say, philosophy. We use uh, some things from, um, uh, philosophy, from Reggio Emilia, from Montessori, but everything comes from social constructivism. You know, that's the base from all these philosophies. You want to call it Waldorf, you want to call it Reggio Emilia, you want to call it Montessori. Sorry, we all these philosophies believe in the child and in their capabilities, you know. So at the end of the day, we call it this is a progressive type of education, no matter what the name is. Let's let's believe in the child. Yes. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. And and the children get to choose what they want to play. And I it's so fun to watch their little concerts and to see their self-esteem blossom in these experiences of music. I grew up singing and my brother is a musician and it's so important for uh, self-expression. And um, there's a, a quote that I pulled from the book that you suggested, Mind in the Making by Ellen Galinsky. And it says that the arts may have survival value in enabling us to reach beyond ourselves, to imagine to understand metaphor and perhaps to prepare for the unknown. Totally, 100%. That's something that we, uh, in our school, we give many opportunities for children to express uh, their talents, talents that they don't know. And that's, that's the key. Let's see how many opportunities we offer children throughout art, in the atelier studio, throughout music, uh, throughout open spaces in the school, and different educators, and let's see if they what do they like. That's why we don't introduce them just to one instrument. Let's introduce them to different instruments. Not all kids are going to like piano or violin or guitar. They, you know, usually like one thing more than another. And then the same thing in the atelier. We have so many resources in different materials, and we give them the opportunity to explore, to feel, to smell, to connect, you know, with different medias to see what they like and what do they want to express. As you were saying, that they're making a dinosaur, but maybe in their mind, a dinosaur is different from our image of a dinosaur. And that's why we said, okay, just create it with the, all the resources that we have here. I think it's just giving that chance, that opportunity for them to find what is that they are connected with. And children love, that's one of the things that I admire so much about children is that they love to learn. You give them something, and it, I, I experienced it with my children. They are so eager and so like, they wanna learn. They wanna be part of these experiences and they enjoy it. And when they don't, they just move to another one and see they really get something that they like. And I think not only for schools, for parents, we have to give this opportunity to our children to kind of expose them to different uh, arts, to different instruments, uh, to different sports. I also noted that curiosity, which has come up so frequently in you know my journey of just reading and understanding and the Book of Joy, the Dalai Lama talks about curiosity 
versus this fear mindset. And part of your, you know, philosophy is to keep children curious. That's the number one thing. And uh, for being curious, I think the first, there are two essential things that we have to do as educators and as parents. It's observe and listen to our children. And when we observe, we notice what are they curious about. And that for us becomes an opportunity to uh, give a provocation. You know, it's what we call, how do I provoke this child to continue being curious? See, the simplest things, but sometimes the simplest things can become the more complex things for adults. You know, if a child asks me, why the sky is blue, it's probably a, you know, a very simple question, but let's see if we have the answer for that. <laughs> and that is, the, that is the amazing thing, that we don't have the answer. And I love when teachers don't have the answer. Why? Because they are kind of into the journey with the child to discover why the sky is blue and to go into that process, not looking for the right answer it's just more for the process of finding why the sky is blue. And that's the thinking process that you have to do with your children. It's, I'm wondering why. I wonder why this is happening or why is the cause of, of, of the sky not being of just one color. So imagine the curiosity of a child when you have this type of comments and questions. I'm curious. I'm the first one that if I'm the guy for the child, I need to be curious with them, you know, because um, once you have the answer of something, I think, you know, and that's what I tell, again, our educators, once you have the answer of something, I think the magic is, is lost. When you also are curious is when the magic begins. Having the beginner mindset and constantly being a student of life is so important. You know, the moment we say, I know, is the moment I fear I don't know. In reality, I'm like, wait, if I'm so sure of this, I should reconsider because it just, you know, the moment we stop learning, it's like um, you freeze in time. I think it's nice to recognize that we go through those processes too, right? That the person that I was 10 years ago, and I hope, you know, like uh, I can continue being like that and not get to the point that I don't want to change. I honestly, I, I'm i always in that like changing mode of I want to know more. I want to learn more. I want to be flexible. I don't want to be just close to one idea. And that's why when... People tell me, oh, what's, you know, you are in this philosophy. I said, no, I'm trying to use the best philosophies of education that we have because there are so many good things to, to get from, from, from everyone and from philosophies, from people that were so wise and also deep and reflected. Why to close myself to, to just one thing when I can provide so many opportunities to our children, to our educators, where we can learn so much. But what I, what, what I say to, you know, to, our, to my team is like, if something is sure about La Piazza is that we're always in constant change, you know, and every year it's different and no one year is going to be the same year as the one before. Yes, we have a curriculum that we follow, but that's kind of a guide of, you know, like we want to see the academics. Yes, we will make sure that we meet the academics, but using different lessons, different, using different experiences, not the same that you used last year because every year brings something different. So yes, I, I love change. I mean, I'm a person that change and what's going to happen next year. How could have we predicted what happened last year? And should I continue with the same curriculum? No, this is a time to speak about the things that matter right now and to expose our, our own children to what's happening in the world. We cannot continue talking about the same things that we used to talk 20 years ago when we can learn again from those experiences, but we need to move forward and see what's happening in the world. Jessica, thank you so much for coming on Brave Talks. Thank you for uh, inspiring me, for inspiring me to talk, to, to kind of 
get out of my heart what I really believe in, which is it in a better education for our own children and for ourselves as parents too. Thank you. I have rapid fire questions before we wrap up. Are you are you okay for some rapid fire? Yes. All right, let's do it. What's something most people don't know about you? People feel that probably I'm very calm and uh, I'm not. I mean, I scream a lot, you know, in my house, especially when I get something that, you know, really bothers me, I I react very strong. We have fire in our bones. (laughs) My husband would tell you the same thing. I'm full of fire. Don't let my morning meditation and prayer fool anyone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can you describe early education in three words? It's it's endless. It's it's something that we I just continue and continue learning. Um, but all this it starts with with love because, and it sounds kind of again the word that everybody will use for something, but early education children, that's the first thing that you see. It's love. Absolutely. What are the three books you recommend people to read when they want to venture into whether it's conscious parenting or progressive early education? Um, you know, the, the first book that I really recommend not only for, uh, a, again, not only for, for educators, but I think as parents, we need to read one that I love. It was the, the uh, conscious parent, which is, uh, by Dr. Shefali. I'm not sure if you had the opportunity to be in our conference with Dr. Shefali, but it's conscious parenting, conscious uh, guide for children. You know, it's it's a, it's conscious parenting by Dr. Shefali definitely is one. Um, I have the hundred languages of children. It's an amazing book for an educator for schools uh, by uh, Lela Gandini. Um, it's a beautiful, it's a way of understanding why children uh, think the way that they think and why are there many other opportunities uh, that they have to learn. And uh, the other one, it was Mind in the Making, um, which it kind of, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of the foundation of understanding the way uh, children think again because that's the first thing it's not how I think it's how children think and then after that then I can work with children so those are the three main books that I recommend uh, they're amazing it gives us an idea and understanding of for children and definitely uh, it changes our it changes our our vision our our image of the child uh, last book you read and loved oh, my favorite favorite book is I love it. And I can read it like, I don't know, like 10, uh, I don't know how many, how many uh, uh, times in, in my life, but every time that I'm in a, like in a situation that I need to like kind of breathe and, and come back again, it's uh, definitely the four agreements. Uh, that book is, uh, and they have it in English and a Spanish version, but the four agreements, um, it's a, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's by, it's by Don Miguel Ruiz. And um, it's a book that it kind of shows you life in a simpler way. Fill in the blank. Life is? Life is full of opportunities. If you could have any job in the world, but not this one, what would you do? I would love to be a pilot. What do you want your legacy to be? My legacy is just try it. Try it. If you don't try it, you will never find all the possibilities. Once you try it, even if it doesn't take you where you want to go, it's going to take you probably to another path, which it was the path that it was the one that was that was meant for you. But just try it. Don't be don't don't feel fear. Just try it. Jessica, I am in awe of your bravery and your just wonderful being and I'm so lucky to have you as a friend and a mentor for so many children and a guide for so many of us going through life. Thank you so much for coming on to Brave Talks and talking about progressive early education and what your experience has been. And I'm sure that a lot of our listeners are really interested in this conversation and are looking for 
you know, schools that are similar to La Piazza in their hometown. And I welcome them to reach out to you or to the school and, you know, ask about how you got started. Maybe there's other questions that they want to follow up with you about. And I'm sure you would welcome that. Thank you, Emily. Thank you for the beautiful opportunity and, and this beautiful talk. Thank you. Eh, gracias a todos por escucharme. Espero que les quede un poquito de lo que yo pude decir y de lo que he aprendido durante estos eh, años que he estado trabajando con niños y con educadores. Y bueno, si me quieren contactar, simplemente eh, mi, mi nombre es Jessica Pinto y me pueden buscar eh, en, en Google, en las redes sociales y alguna pregunta con muchísimo gusto les voy a, a contestar. Gracias. Brave Talks is sponsored by Taja Collection Custom Candles. You can find the candle on tajacollection.com. That's T-A-J-A collection.com. And you can search for Be Pretty Brave. Brave Talks is produced by Madeline Inskeep. Video production is by Wallace Cruz. The music is produced by my dear friend, Murray Hittery, with Mind Travel. A heartfelt thanks to these three who support Brave Talks with their incredible talent and gifts. If you'd like to receive my monthly thoughts and a recap of this month's Brave Talks, head on over to emilynolan.com and click subscribe. Brave Talks is powered by Zencaster. Thanks for listening.